Welcome to the European PowerShell Conference 2020 at home edition. My name is Torsten Butz and my hobbies are playing the ukulele and collecting marks. My talk is about querying uh, Wikidata with a glimpse of sparkle and I hope you don't mind that my focal point today is not PowerShell itself. Instead, I want to connect technologies. Web services on the one hand, your favorite scripting language on the other. Wikidata is an amazing source of knowledge and I want you to understand how to tap into it, how to tap into the data that's in it. For this reason, I will break down how to use Sparkle, the semantic query language that was made for this kind of work. I guess it's time now to get into work mood. Um, let's put on my sharp glasses and move over to Hanover. Beam me up, Scotty. We all know and love Wikipedia. And it's almost a miracle that it became so powerful over the last 20 years. Despite the fact that it's simply community-driven, but maybe it's just because of this. But there is more. Underneath the hood, there is a well-designed data layer and you can access uh, these resources and add or change information the same way that you used to do this with uh, Wikipedia. One of the reasons that Wikipedia works so great is the good design of Wikidata. You see it here. There are a few things that you need to know. The first things that you'll notice is that items such as Ada Lovelace here, are not represented by their names. They are represented by so-called Q numbers, Q7259 in this case. The reason is quite simple. There might be numerous objects with the same name. There might be schools or airports, uh, wards or associations using the same name. And th simply think about different languages. Ada Lovelace, as a person herself, is always the same. If you want to find out who Ada was, you can simply search for the, the, using the web interface. That's not too sophisticated, uh, but what if we want to find out people just like Ada? And this is what a query looks like. On first sight, it's familiar. It seems to be familiar. It starts with the obvious select. We're looking for a programmer. We're looking for a date of birth, something with a label. But then it gets weird. Here in the center, there are lots of numbers that don't mean anything. And I think we need a little help. If we just add a few commands, I did it here, and review it, I guess it's a little bit un easier to understand. Not only human beings, such as Ada Lovelace, are represented by Q numbers. Almost everything is represented by a number. Um, a Q number for the occupation programmer, a Q number for female, and there are more numbers that you need to connect the dots. For example, the occupation or sex or gender are represented by so-called properties, and you utilize it to create these queries. If we look at it again, we simply find out that this query searches for female pre programmers. And we also want to see the date of birth, uh, simply because I want to limit the results for ladies from the 19th century. And let's find out if that works. And now we are querying Wikidata live. And let's see uh, what are the results. And yeah, as expected, we find Ada Lovelace, but it's the only item. Um, nice thing about it, we can uh, change the query. We can do this uh, here in the web interface. And um, one thing we can change now is that we simply extend the time range. 
So let's find out what happens if I say I'm interested in the 19th and 20th century. I repeat the query. We have to wait a few seconds and then we will find out there are over 70 results and we found Ada again, but we also found um, a lot of other ladies. Um, the only thing that annoys me a little bit is that if you look at the date of birth, uh, it's somehow get random here. So I think it's um, useful if we order it by date of birth. And we can simply do this if we add here something. This is almost self-explaining. We say we want to order it by the date of birth. So let's do that again. And that looks very good. And we see first place is still Ada. And then it's Grace Hopper, then Betty, and so on. And you see the power of uh, Wikidata. But what about these strange kind of queries? Um, I'll explain it uh, to you. And uh, for this, we have to go back to the slides. The query that you just saw is a so-called Sparkle query. It's a key technology from the people of the W3Org in their approach to a semantic web. It's a query language for databases who store um, the data sets in a specific format, in the RDF format. Um, if we have a look at the code snippet here, we are simply for you looking for data who apply to being instances of humans. We are simply looking for human beings. And because there are so many in the, in the Wikidata database, we limit it to 10 here. The key concept is quite simple. Human is nothing else than a variable. It makes a ton of sense to make it um, meaningful. A Q5, you already know that is the Q number. It's the number for items. And then we have another uh, kind of numbers, numbers for properties, in this case, instances of. The one thing missing here are the so-called prefixes. Sparkle is by no means limited to Wikidata. It's meant to be a general approach, and you have a lot of databases that you can query with this language. In this case, because we simply query uh, Wikidata today, it's WDT for a property and it's WD for an item. So you just saw an example, but how to create these Sparkle queries from scratch? Let's try that once again in the web interface. You already know that query, but let's start from scratch. The nice thing in the web interface is that you can click on the information here on the little icon and you can create your own sentences here, right here in that interface. So for example, we are looking for someone like Jean-Luc Picard, for example. And you see what happens here. Um, the system guesses what I want to know, but um, actually I was looking for the performer of uh, Jean-Luc Picard. So let's change this here. And you see there is a um, property for performer. Okay, this is what was my intention. And now I hit the play button. And let's find out who was the performer of Jean-Luc Picard. And you see, it's amazing. It's not what I expected. Dixon Hill, never heard. Um, one of the problems with um, the semantic triple is that you sometimes confuse yourself with the order of appearance. In, in this case, it might well be that in some episodes, Jean-Luc Picard, the character, are... Uh, played a role of another figure. And maybe that was Dixon Hill. Honestly, I don't know. But what I meant is, um, who played Jean-Luc Picard? What I can do now, what I can try now is simply change the order here. So let's try that for a second. I disable it. And everything I try is, I put them in another order. So... 
This is obviously Jean-Luc Picard. And I'm looking for the performer. This was this little property. And this is the variable that we want to store the information. So uh, if my sentence is complete, I should use a full stop. And then again, query. And yes, this is what it was meant to be. Great. Um, this happens very often. This is the simple reason why I wanted to show you this in first place. But maybe uh, we find, a, we find a, a little bit easier uh, property uh, to search for. Let's, for example, find out a little bit about the creator of Jean-Luc Picard, where it all goes back to. This is Gene Roddenberry. And again, this time, uh, the system uh, was quite good in guessing what I mean. Um, we are looking for data sets that has a creator flag, um, Gene Roddenberry. So let's find out. Do a query here. And you see, yeah, exactly, it worked. And here's Jean-Luc Picard again, the one thing that I had before. Let's have a brief look at the data set there. If I click on the queue number, the system takes me to the HTML representation of the data set. And then you see what we partially already know. You see Jean-Luc Picard is an instance of a fictional human, a television character, and something else. We have an image here. He's male. Country of citizenship, United Federation of Planets, quite interesting. And somewhere here, we have to find Gene Roddenberry. So let's have a look. Date of birth, children, and so on, so on. And I can, of course, I can search here um, with Control F, but I already found it. This is why Jean-Luc Picard appears in the data sets and the results, because um, it has a property. It was created by Gene Roddenberry, exactly what we were looking for. So knowing this, uh, we might want to get some more information. For example, we, we, sa we saw that date of birth is here, um, is mentioned. And if I want the results to display a little bit more, then I can click on the show button and I can try what I'm looking for. In this case, it's date of birth. And uh, the interesting thing is that if you click here on the show button, it's optional. So there is no necessity to have a date of birth. And if we uh, watch out for the results now, we see it doesn't change a lot. But in terms of Jean-Luc Picard, we see there is a date of birth. So what if I want to make this property mandatory? I don't want to spoil my results with all the stuff that doesn't have such a property, filled with useful information, of course. It's very, very simple because all we have to do in this case is that we have to remove um, the optional um, statement. And if we have a close look again, what does it say? We're looking for data sets who apply to these statements, to these sentences, to these semantic triples. First of all, it must be created by Gene Roddenberry. And the second thing is it must have a date of birth. And the funny thing is that um, I can introduce the variable date of birth this way. Because I never used that before, but as you can see, if I click on the button now, I almost get the same results that I had before, but limited to those characters who have a date of birth. But let's go back to Sparkle. Uh, we see how this works and let adds a little bit more. And you now see the, uh, the graphical user interface is a little bit limited here. Not everything you can do in the Sparkle directly um, is represented on the left-hand side. But let, just let's 
add a little bit more. Um, for example, I saw something like country or uh, citizenship, something like that. Country citizen citizenship. C ah, here now I found it. Country of citizenship um, provides information of the citizenship. Quite interesting, and maybe one thing more. Maybe I also want to have the languages that someone speaks. And now we get a pretty nice um, result. And you see, um, again, we have Jean-Luc Picard. We now know where he was born, uh, when he was born. We see the country of citizenships. And we also see that he speaks um, some languages. But there's a little problem. Um, I have to zoom in a little bit. Um, you can see here um, the the table is a little bit spoiled by all the numbers. So, and now I want to show you for a second how we can optimize that here a little bit with a very a simple approach. Um, as you saw already, um, data is represented by numbers. And to make a difference here, you can display the number, for example, the number for the variable Gene Roddenberry, and you can also display um, the label in your language. And that's the important stuff. This line here tells the system that you want to use the language of your browser, or if you want to change that to French or Dutch, or maybe German, you simply have to add your language here. This is what happens. And if I try this again, if there are different, um, if there are different uh, names, for example, by here you can see this at citizenship, then it will use that in your local language. But let's go back to English. That makes a ton of sense here. Um, but I want to limit the results here a little bit because I'm not so interested in all the numbers. Um, for example, the country or citizenship number is not so super interesting. Um, same is true for the languages. So I remove it here. And the only thing I keep is um, the basic item of the variable Gene Roddenberry. So one more thing. And you see, it makes sense now. This is a proper result. I want to keep the Q number of the basic items. But there is one thing that I'm still not satisfied with. And this is simply the term Gene Roddenberry. This is auto-generated here, and it does not really make so much sense in this case, because this is not, it doesn't represent Gene Roddenberry. It represents the characters he invented. So what we might want to do is that we now name it a little bit more meaningful. So for example, uh, we could name it character. And the only bad thing is there is no replace functionality here. So I have to change it in any occurrence. I do it like this. So I hope I didn't miss anything. There is one more. So, and you get the basic idea. Now it's readable. It should be readable. So let's have a brief look at the results. Great. So far, it's so good. This is the basic principle. We call it semantic triple. It's based off a subject, a predicate, and an object. And sometimes you confuse the order. And I guess Jean-Luc Picard is a very good example, but you will find out there are more of this. Now that you have a basic understanding of Sparkle, we can move on to PowerShell. So let's return 
for one more time to the web interface, because again, the web interface makes it actually pretty easy to create some PowerShell code. So one more ex example. I want to start from scratch one more time and search for our favorite tech company. I start with searching for Paul Allen. And if you query for Paul Allen, you see that he founded a bunch of companies. You see it here. One of it is Microsoft, but there are many more. And I guess the same is true for Bill Gates. Let's find out. But there is one thing uh, different now. Um, I can query for Bill Gates, but I can also query for both of them. And if I, um, and if I display the results, you see company, the only company that's left is Microsoft. This, this is actually what I wanted to have. If you have more than one sentence like this, you of course can use it the way you see it here, but you can also ease this thing a little bit. What you can do here is you can remove the multiple occurrences of the variable and simply say, I combine these two queries with a semicolon. This will work, but because the property is uh, also the same, we can easy, uh, ease, ease it a little bit more. We can simplify it and that's the way it looks like when you simply use the element of the right hand side separated with a comma. That simply means exactly the same that what we had before. Uh, you want to come, you want to find some data sets, companies in this case that are founded by this guy and this guy. So the one thing left is that, again, the variable is not very useful. So let's change this here and here. And I guess we have a good starting point now to create our, our first PowerShell script with that. Um, this is company label, okay, and Let's make it a little bit nicer. So first check if this works. Looks, pr looks promising. So the magic behind this web front end, you will find out is again here in the little details. Um, if you click on code, you see what it takes to use this stuff in scripting languages or in any language that you like, in any technique that you like. This is nothing else than a URL you can use for your query. You can embed it in HTML, you can use it for Wikilink or PHP or whatever that all is, you must know that. Um, you may choose from the one thing that you prefer, let's say for example, Python, and then you can go through the code and simply copy it. So one thing left, they do not mention PowerShell. But if you ever work with the web commandlets, with web services, you know that it's actually, it's always the same. So the only thing that you really need is to get a basic idea. What's the endpoint? How do I query it? And uh, what's the syntax that they expect me to use? So you can simply use that Python as an example, or the easiest one for a first try is nothing else than the URL. So if you copy this, I already done that, um, you can use that in your PowerShell code. So let's find out how this works. Um, this is the Sparkle that we just recreated. And if you want to use that in a PowerShell code, let's start with some very basic things. Maybe the one or the other thing is a little bit smarter. Um, this is the address that we need. It's pretty long. And now you could use that, for example, with something like curl. And now you may be a bit, little, little bit surprised because I promised you to talk about PowerShell. But uh, don't, don't hurry. Um, 
we will come to that. This is also PowerShell, but I know it's not a PowerShell commandlet. But anyhow, you see how it works. Uh, you utilize this uh, URL, this uniform resource identifier, and then you can say, okay, give me, give me back the data, and it will re be returned uh, in XML by default, but you can also utilize JSON, something like that. And what I, uh, to be honest, <laughs> I do prefer this one, comma separated value. Why do I prefer this one? Um, my job is to explain stuff like PowerShell to other people. And the one thing that every operator gets, the one thing that anyone knows is comma separated value. So for me, the first example is always CSV. So you might want to choose whatever you like. Um, for example, XML, the default um, stuff that returns. So and now let's be serious. How is that done in PowerShell? It's that simple. You simply use that URL and you call invoke web request. And first of all, let's do it like this. And this is simply how the web command lets work. Yeah? This is what you queried. And we all know that we actually do not use all of this. We actually want to have the content. So let's do it like this. I'm pretty sure that a lot of um, you watching me here um, are now shaking your head and saying, no, no, don't do that. It, it can be simplified. I know. It's way more easier if you directly use invoke rest method because more or less that is the basic difference between these two commandlets. What invoke rest method does is it extracts and interprets uh, the content that we already saw. So if we do it like this, we do get back the XML code. Uh, we can save this to a variable. And the problem with XML is that you do not see all the data. You just see the starting point, the main node. So one trick may be that you simply write it down to a text file, something like that. And then you can uh, open the text file and you'll see what returned in terms of XML and can use it. But that, there's one more thing that is way more um, easy um, as a starting point. Maybe not so powerful, but definitely super easy. What about what we already saw in curl? What about requesting a certain type of data? What about requesting comma separated value? And what you see here is I already got that what I wanted. And if I do convert it from CSV now, I got proper objects. This first example is way too easy to see the power of it, but we will come to this in a second. So let's go a little bit, de a little bit further. Uh, working with this URL is pretty powerful and reliable, but it's not really human readable. So wouldn't it be a good idea if we embed the sparkle directly. And I have to mention that, please be careful if you do that. You likely will run into encoding problems here, but give it a try. So what you can do is, we simply use the sparkle directly, and then we use invoke rest, rest method. And you see it's exactly the same what we had before. And to prove that my um, preferred way of doing it with the CSV also work. You see it here. So this, of course, is more or less everything you need to know. Try this, use the web front end, and uh, be lucky. But one more time, be aware, it, you might run into encoding problems here. So don't forget about the URL. One more thing, um, presenting stuff like that to people um, means that you're looking for easy to understand examples. And of course, in a PowerShell script, you're not so super interested in the people that found in Microsoft. But let's say, for example, you're interested 
in the IP address ranges that Microsoft uses. At least that's what Wikidata says. It may or may not be a perfect solution because um, maybe this data works for you or maybe it's incomplete, but give it a try. And once again, there are other databases and um, you can try other databases and you, you can fill up this information. Um, I want to return to my, I want to go back to my, my first example with the people and stuff like that. Um, if we talk about Microsoft, there are not only the founders, there are many, many employers and employees in Microsoft. And I'm pretty sure that some of these people will um, be mentioned in the Wikipedia. And I prepared something here. Um, I'm looking now for Microsoft employees. This is a uh, line four. And beyond that, I'm looking for those people who have a uh, GitHub username and um, who are marked with a notable work, with something Im important they did. And uh, let's first of all return um, to the web interface to see the basic results. And I will return here to um, enhance this in PowerShell. But first of all, we go here. And see the results. Yeah, and it's um, notable. There are a bunch of people working at Microsoft that did something great um, that's mentioned in Wikipedia and Wikidata. And there's one pretty good example for Miguel here, the inventor of GNOME or GNOME or Genome or however that is pronounced. And that's not the only thing he did. He's also the main man, from my knowledge, um, um, focusing on the technology Mono, Xamarin. And what you see here is, again, we have a problem that we already had before. Miguel is simply one person, so we really would like to see him once in this uh, table. Um, we don't want to see him mentioned twice. And that, re re that brings me to the idea that I wanted to group this information before. And I guess I should show you now how that is done. And one last time back to the slides. And I will come back here very, uh, very soon. So let's summarize quickly what we saw. The web front end makes it very easy. You can query the web service um, and you grab the URL and then you can use the tool you like. You're not limited to PowerShell. Use whatever you like. And this might be curl, <laughs> this might be a Python script or what's more appropriate here, um, you might want to embed the Sparkle query in your script and then you use invoke rest method. Uh, very, very easy. You get objects back and finally you find results, stuff like that. And it may be useful for you that every data set here occurs multiple times, just in case that you see this example here, um, the targeted pro properties are filled with more than one item. You can group this, this with the PowerShell, but you can also group this uh, using Sparkle queries. And this is done like that. It's a little bit confusing when you do that for the first time. So let's have a, um, let's have a quick look at the details here. And I really want you to try that out. What's the first thing that you need to know? We mentioned that um, people like Miguel have more than one entry uh, in their profile in their data set for a notable work. If you want to concatenate that, you see that here above, you can say do this. Uh, this is done here in the select area. 
you can choose the separator that you like and then you can give it a certain variable name. I try to make this readable by utilizing a prefix such as R, uh, ARR and I know that was me, this is an array. Uh, or at least that can be interpreted as an array, whatsoever that is. Um, the second thing that you have to change is very strange because until now we actually didn't care um, too much about the um, service uh, and the, the label service from Wikidata, but now it's getting important because today in 2020 there is a little bug that requires you to name all the all those properties exactly um, that you want to return. If you don't do this, your script generally will work, but you will get um, a table back um, where some of the results are missing. You get blank fields. So to try that out. But if you will, uh, want to avoid that trouble, um, you have to name the important properties here. And finally, this is done here below. Um, you might want to say, um, I'm only interested in people who have a certain amount of uh, notable work and it, this can be done with this element having here. And you see, I only want to see people that are mentioned at least twice. So very, very confusing if you do this for complex queries. So really take care, but it's a powerful tool. So again, let's see how this is made. I already uh, started the query and you see we do it like that and to make you believe that this is really the same thing that you already saw, I will show you the query. Yeah, it's exactly what we had before in the slide. So, but again, if I do now, oops, look at the table, you see there are only two people who are mentioned twice in this property, so very, very powerful. This is the one thing that I wanted uh, you to show, but there is more, because I, I already mentioned um, you can do this on client side either. So let's look at this. But first of all, same stuff, done with PowerShell and you see it's definitely the same that you already saw on the web interface. So, but let's talk about the client side. I have a little bit more here. I extended this example and I don't want to focus here on every line, but you will see the technique is more or less the same. The only difference is that I grouped a bunch of properties. I grouped the notable work, I grouped the citizenship, I grouped the awards that these people uh, received and stuff like that. So that makes it very uh, interesting. And beyond that, I didn't remove all the employees that do not fulfill this criteria, but instead I um, query for all employees plus this additional information. And then you can do whatever you want with the returning results. So let's find out how this works. First of all, I have to, I want to move this up a little bit. Why doesn't that work? Yeah, okay, so let's start here. First of all, that's the query. I used an encoded one, so now I can move it up. And you see, in this case, I'll um, get three, over 300 items, over 300 employees. And what I can do now, uh, thanks to the fact that um, PowerShell 7 also supports an outgrid view, I can also view this here. And for example, let's look for someone like Jeffrey Snover, and you will find him here. Or look for someone like Miguel, 
And you see there are two Miguels, but this is the one that we had before. And you see it's beautifully aligned up here with uh, also the citizenship and notable work. Yeah, and finally, um, you can group that on your own here on the client side and do whatever you want to do. So what I think is interesting here is that um, what citizenships do people have and what is, the, uh, what is their value for the company? What did they do? What did they achieve? And you will find a lot of interesting people here. And these queries you can use um, for creating your own uh, structure. Um, in this case, I told you that citizenship can be interpreted as an array, but actually um, this is simply aligned with a comma, so you have to work on that, of course, and you see there are a bunch of people with more than one citizenship. It's ev honestly everything I wanted to show. But finally, and I really like to show you this last um, example here, uh, I can also create my own Excel sheet. And let's find out how that works. Of course, it takes a minute to create the query. And then again, the Excel sheet is uh, opened. And as you can see here, here are all the people. And what you can do here, of course, you can utilize Excel to find all the people that you're interested in. For example, if you want to create a certain list to find people on GitHub, or if you want to create another list to find people on Twitter, you can now do this in Sparkle. You can do this uh, with PowerShell. And you can also do this here in the Excel sheet. This is what I wanted you to show. And uh, it's up to you to use it your way. Summary. I hope you don't mind that I didn't focus too much on PowerShell as a technology today. I really wanted to show you how you can combine all the valuable resources that you find on the web with your favorite shell. We also saw that PowerShell is not yet a first-class citizen in terms of Wikidata. Wikidata um, but I think the basic principles of an object-based shell perfectly align with the basic principles of web services. So I really like to combine these two elements. And I think this will be very, very important in the future. I want you to try it out. I will attach a bunch of lab files and demo files examples with these slides. You will find it all in the repository. And I hope you like it. But there's one more thing. I think it's really sad that we cannot meet in place this year, 2020. I really wish that would be different, but maybe next year it will be better. I really, really hope that you will find the time having a beer. And this um, leads me to my final example. I thought it would be useful if we, I create a sparkle that delivers all the pubs in the neighborhood of the HCC. And this is what it looks like. And maybe you will utilize it next year to find your next favorite pub. And uh, let's see if it works. And we get back a table here. Looks like this. Um, Maybe the one thing or the other thing is missing here. If your favorite pub is missing, create an account on Wikidata and add it to the database. But anyhow, hope we meet here somewhere. And finally, this is not only deliverable as a table. You can also let them create a map. And I'm pretty sure you now get an idea how powerful Wikidata is and that I really showed you the tip of the iceberg. And maybe you're interested in finding out how it works 
on your own. So to absent friends, hope we see us next year. My name is Thorsten Butz. Um, maybe you want to subscribe to my podcast. It's slidingwindows.de. You have uh, a mix of English and German episodes. Hope you like it. Slides and demo code uh, on GitHub. And finally, see you next year.